back in Harmony Land. This is kind of a rare model. It's like extra in the way the kids use the word, you know? It's got everything. Um, this is a Sovereign, basically you could call it the deluxe model. It's the top of the line H1265. And they only made them for two years, 1967 and 68. So what makes this upgraded from a standard H1260 Sovereign? I hear you saying. Eh, not that much, really. And they went all out on the tortoise budget and gave it the asymmetrical double pick guards, which have come loose in this case. And it's also on the headstock, so, you know, you'd look real swell at the local hootenanny. It's also got, um, we'll call it a traditional pin bridge, um, rather than the top-loading classical style that they were using on their other models at this point. And what a bridge it is. They took thick slabs of prime Brazilian rosewood and sculpted them into the evocative symbol of freedom, a majestic eagle soaring over a field of spruce the color of rich, creamery butter. Try one today. So that will make a tonal difference. You know, you've also got a competent-looking sunburst in the areas that aren't obscured by the pickguard. And we all know that that adds loads of volume and character to the sound of any guitar, as do the block inlays on the uh, fingerboard, rather than just little dots. So yeah, it's a Harmony Sovereign. The sound hole is still too far forward to make it look anything but awkward if you're used to gazing at Martin's big headstock. It's like a jazz guitar. Um, tuners that started off pretty rough and don't improve with age. Um, but we are in the era when they started putting in the adjustable truss rods, which is nice. We've got some hope of keeping the neck straight. Nice quality mahogany, Brazilian rosewood board and bridge. What more could you ask for? This needs a neck reset. Virtually every vintage Harmony does at this point, so if you decide to buy one, factor that into your decision. And of course the pick guards came off. We're going to try and restick those. There are some cracks to deal with. We'll see what we can do about the tuners. Uh, no strings on this, so I'm going to put a straight edge on the neck and see what the relief looks like. Not bad. About five or six thousandths. Won't complain about that. I'll also project the line of the top of the frets down to the bridge. And even without strings, I can tell the action is probably way high. Likely around 11 sixty-fourths. Somewhere around 4.5 millimeters. Um, basically twice what we'd want to see. Let's take a peek inside. Make sure there are no scorpions. Peering into the interior, we find an issue. The bridge plate has a crack that runs right through it along its entire length. Now that may have started when they didn't back up the pressure exerted by drilling the pinholes, as you can see, resulting in absolute carnage. I can't leave it like this. It's a structural issue. It's got to come out. I'm trying to get the gunk off this sucker. And uh, nothing really works well. People will holler at me, use the goo gone, goo gone, goo gone, and it doesn't. I'm sorry, it really doesn't. It just doesn't cut it. Um, naphtha kind of works if I scrape at it long enough, but I think most of the action is from my fingernail, to be honest. Um, the only thing that would really work would be lacquer thinner, but that would also melt all of the lacquer. So. I'm going to do my best to sort of scrape off as much as I can. I would like the surface nice and flat and clean, of course, if I'm going to be reapplying the pick guards, or as close as I can get it. You know, the other option is to get in there with a razor blade scraper and just, you know, I'm doing that in areas that will be covered by the eventual pick guard. But even that's not, it's just, it becomes one with the finish in a way that is hard to describe. It looks like an attempt was made with super glue to hold down a part that was particularly loose and floppy, I guess. Scraping, scraping, scraping. This is contact adhesive, by the way, sometimes known as barge cement. 
I'll get a generous coating of glue in and around the cracks. Force it on through with a suction cup. While that's clamping, I'll make some cleats. I make the cleats individually for each job because it's just less tedious that way. I don't mind the extra minute and a half it takes to cut them. Got to clean out the surfaces, obviously, because they're pretty grungy from 50 years worth of hanging around. Put on a generous dollop of fish glue in this case, and it's on a pointed stick again. And that helps me sort of position it up near the um, edge of the lining where it has to be. This one, I think we can safely say, is going to be an annoyance because it's extremely out of alignment. The side has been pushed in and the crack itself has happened just above the top of the lining strip on the inside, the kerfing. So magnets would be a nice thing to use but unfortunately I don't think they'd be powerful enough to push this back into place and because the lining itself is triangular in shape you're not going to get good contact anyway. Uh, we're going to have to use a prop. I have a collection of props of different lengths these are made out of dowel, some cork on the end, that have been bored with uh, a hole slightly larger than this quarter twenty threaded rod. The uh, rod slips into the hole and using this through board knob to push against the dowel I get pressure. And um, the working ends are also covered in cork and um, some plastic tape to act as a glue release. I have different uh, configurations. I've got a concave one and a convex one and uh, a straight one as well. So I'll find the one that's closest in size. That's probably it. The trick when making one of these is to choose a length that you can reach through the sound hole without too much hassle. There's only so much pressure you can apply, of course, because we're dealing with sides that are pretty thin. And there are instances where um, the overlap of the wood, one piece over another, just refuses to allow it to go back into alignment. In which case we have to cut away some material to let that happen. And unfortunately I think that's, uh, this is one of those cases. Out comes the scalpel, and I'm going to cut in at an angle, creating um, sort of like a scarf joint between the two halves, running directly along the line of the crack. And it might take multiple passes. So I'm really only removing like a hairline's worth of wood, but it's the stuff that was impeding progress. Okay, that's much closer to flat than it was. Still not perfect, but better. Glue. In this case I'm using the yellow carpenter's glue tight bond because um, it's slightly more flexible than the uh, hard glue or fish glue. And in this case where the crack is kind of under tension in certain areas um, I think it adds a bit of a bounce effect um, or an elastic kind of a quality to it which can help in case it ever gets you know knocked on the side or something. In terms of bridge plates, one of these harmonies that is just a simple rectangle, usually softwood, uh, is probably the easiest to remove, to be honest. Versus something like, well, the absolute worst is a Gibson from the late 60s or early 70s. Those are a plywood bridge plate, and in their double X brace design, it's completely surrounded on all four sides by braces, so there's no free area for you to get a knife under. In which case you basically have to start cutting into the surface of it and try and peel back the plywood layer by layer. Which is, it's absolutely no fun. In this case I'm going to start off with a seriously damp paper towel. I'm just going to try and sort of wash down the edges of the plate to start off with. And uh, try and get some moisture to the glue line itself. And then I'll just leave the wet cloth sitting on top of it upend the guitar and leave it there 
for about half an hour or so and try and get some water into the, um, the bridge plate itself so that when I heat it up it's already got sort of a head start on making some steam. Here are some tools I use for this operation. The first is just a bent over pallet knife heated up with a blowtorch. And um, the second, well this is actually a miniature plane blade. It's not super sharp. I use it more like a wedge. And these are designed so that I can come in from behind and pull towards me. Friends, I gotta tell you, this is one of the more annoying things that you can do in guitar work. You find yourself contorted into all kinds of strange positions. Getting splinters and... Yeah, no fun. It's disintegrating as I go, of course. Okay, this thing is about 140 thousandths thick, which is about 3.5 millimeters. It's spruce, uh, probably a soundboard offcut. Um, not the greatest material for making a bridge pad that's going to be uh, absorbing the ball ends of the strings, so I'm going to use maple for my reproduction. It'll be much thinner than this. It'll be about probably like 2.2, 2.3 millimeters. 85 or 90 thousandths of an inch thick. I like maple. It's hard. It's reasonably light. Other manufacturers used it in the golden age. I round the edges over because I don't want sharp right angles inside the guitar. And then of course we've got to measure the string spacing so I can drill a couple of holes in the plate through which I'll pass some bolts uh, to keep it in alignment. I've also got a fairly thick clamping pad on there as well because I'm going to need a bunch of clamps and this will spread the pressure around. It's a very large bridge plate. Now it's time to drill the rest of the holes and I'll learn from history and won't be doomed to repeat it. I think that's much cleaner. That's the way I want to see it. Paradoxical though it might seem, sometimes the top edge here is the easiest place to get in uh, with a knife because the neck when it's put on has a bit of a back set and the fingerboard extension is pushed down to meet the top um, so usually this is the first place at the end here that meets the top and there's often a little bit of space just down at this top corner here so good place to try I'll pull out the 15th fret to gain access to the little space at the end of the dovetail pocket, which usually falls right underneath it, or maybe just a little bit to the side. That came out cleanly. When drilling, I didn't actually feel a void, which was disconcerting, although it felt crunchy and I realized I was drilling through glue. There seemed to be a whole lot of glue in there. In go the hot wire foam factory foam cutters, which I use. Yeah, there was a whole lot of glue in that pocket probably the most I've ever seen. It took a while to clean it all off. You can see remnants of what may have been a matchstick or something they used as a shim on one side. Gently undercut the cheek of the dovetail uh, just down towards the bottom. Mostly I'm just clearing out the glue. Clean off the top surface a bit, make it flat and smooth. Then it's on to sandpaper pulling to correct the angle of the heel. Quite a lot of material had to be removed this time, so there was a lot of pulls. Clean off the dust between each pull. I glued some mahogany shims on either side of the dovetail so I could perfect the fit by filing and sanding those and testing and retesting. When everything is ready, you can do the test where you put the neck in place and pick it up and it doesn't fall off. Here's another situation. I just want you to take note of the center line of the top versus the center line of the bridge. It's shifted over maybe 3 sixteenths of an inch. Because of the big neck angle change, I have to plane a tapered wedge 
for the fingerboard extension. When they glued the fingerboard extension down last time, they used some like a white paste filler of some kind, which doesn't actually follow the outline all that well. And I'm going to take it off because I'm going to stain the wedge dark. I've tried it different ways. I find that having a dark wedge looks better because you can never really match the color of the binding and it just seems to, I don't know, it's visually more satisfying. Here's a clamping call that overhangs the brace so I don't have to put clamps on it. Have a look at the saddle insert here. Um, this is supported by the two washers on either side and um, there are little screws that are threaded into the base and uh, that just sort of pushes up against the washer. Um, you can see that the saddle itself this seems to be a nylon material or something similar and it's been deeply notched to uh, lower the action over the years. The spacing is kind of rudimentary. So I'm going to replace that with a piece of bone. It's quite a narrow saddle at about 75 thousandths, which is slightly less than two millimeters. Putting a radius on top of the saddle. Let's point out something with regards to the headstock facing on these that can sometimes get people in trouble. There are several models from this period that have celluloid facings like this. I think the Buck Owens models are really prone to this too. They shrink a lot. The issue is the plastic at this point it's being held in place at a few points like the truss rod cover screws and if you're lucky the tuner grommets but the shrinkage is never uniform. What can happen is the holes for the bushings tend to contract in one direction or the other and in this case we have a bushing that popped loose and I don't know if you can see this, but the hole is really far off center now, underneath the facing. Now that can put excess pressure on the tuner post because the bushing wants to be farther away, you know, from the hole where it's supposed to be. So in this case, I have to cut away a tiny little bit of material on one side of the hole to make this fit in because this will not go back in place. It'll go through the top layer, but not back into the wood. So, you know, this is the kind of stuff that can drive you nuts because I can't even string this to get the setup underway until I've done this. What about retrofitting for newer tuners? Yes, you can, but I have to warn you, the plastic is the shape it is because it's being held there. If you take everything off at once, it will literally contract and shrink and you'll never get it to line back up again. So if you want to change tuners, do them one at a time and be quick about it. Now I might slip a little bit of tight bond in areas around the top here just to hold it in place a bit, but I'm not taking these tuners off. Service it a bit and see if the owner can deal with it. If not, we may, maybe we go back and get some shalers or something nice. But um, changing tuners on these can be a bit of a hassle. Just, just to warn you. That's probably a better shot. You can see it. And as discussed recently, these bushings tend to be really prone uh, to falling out. Keep an eye on them. I've got to stick these guards back on. And really, the only thing I've had success with on these thick, multiply, slightly warped guards is the same thing they used the first time around, which is contact cement. It's nasty stuff, but it works. It'll stay on for another 35 or 40 years. I'm putting it on both surfaces to bond, but I'm trying to keep it a couple of millimeters from the edge because if this squeezes out onto the visible surface, it's super hard to clean off. It'll pull off in long rubbery strings, but again, no solvent will clean it without damaging the surface. As soon as the two surfaces touch, they're bonded. There's no repositioning. 
After that, I'll go along with some clamps and I'll really make sure they're well pressed together, but you really only get one chance to put it in the right spot. That's why I have this taped margin around the whole thing. So I know exactly where to put it because I can't shift it after it touches. Polishing, polishing, polishing. Okay, just checking out the relief in the neck. We seem to be about 15, 16 thousandths, so I'm going to want to adjust the truss rod. Uh, these tuners, absolutely abysmal. Just on the very cusp of not workable, actually. So I'm going to contact the owner and suggest that maybe we invest in some new tuners. Um, I'm thinking some Grover style. Uh, number one, because they have a larger post diameter, so I'd have to enlarge the holes, and that would take care of the misalignment issue between the facing and the actual meat of the headstock. Um, and they also have threaded bushings that go down into the base. So I think that's the way to go because you, would, you get a little more pressure and not having to worry about the sort of shifting sands of this bouncy um, facing material. Um, so, you know, I'll put some in order for him if he wants. Fabulous piece of design. I think I'm going to have to take the strings off and actually remove the nut in order to get some purchase for my socket because string nut is sitting on top of the uh, adjustment nut. Yeah, that was never tightened at the factory. Okay, I lubricated the threads and now I have to sort of guesstimate um, how tight it should be, of course, because in order to figure that out I'm going to have to put the nut back on, which is just wild to me. Before I do that, I think I'm going to file a little half moon out of the bottom of this nut to make room for the adjustment. And those weird things you got to do sometimes. Some of the nut slots were too high for comfort. I adjusted them. Get a load of this. Okay, I think that's enough to make a video. I still have a little bit of finish touch-up to do on the side cracks and stuff and probably replace the tuners, but this should give you a pretty good feel for what this sort of revival entails. Harmony guitars pose some challenges, but they're usually pretty predictable. And once they're done up, they make a very enjoyable instrument in a lot of cases, if you're a fan of the ladder brace sound. Not everyone is. And the question always comes around to, is it worth it? Well these often need a whole bunch of things to get them up to speed. That's why I tell people who want to learn repair work they're a very good place to start because they'll give you a whole bunch of jobs in one instrument to do. This being a slightly rarer model, um, I saw someone trying to sell one of these on Reverb in the range of $2,000 and that seems kind of crazy to me but then you know I'm not in that sector of the collector's market. I don't know. As a musical tool though, well and you've got the drop-in adjustable saddle, which almost ensures the lowest amount of string energy transfer possible. You've got the huge bridge, the softwood bridge plate, all this unstable plastic material bonded in various ways. Um, the frets on these tend to be quite low, which you may or may not like. In this case, they're in good shape, but low. And then, you know, you've got to make peace with the styling aesthetics. You know, it's sort of like the Fender Antigua burst. You know, some people like it, others think it looks like a dirty porcelain ashtray. Uh, but for some, this might complete the look they're going for on stage. This could be it, you know. Amplifying one of these things? Well, you better get yourself a sound hole pickup. An old DeArmond or something. Because unless you pull out this unit and then plug it, you're not going to be able to use an undersaddle pickup, and a bridge plate transducer is not going to do very well either. So, you know, I don't know. I don't hate this thing. It actually has a really good sound to my ears, and it actually has some charm. It's also got a very beefy, robust neck. There is one thing I'll say against it. Uh, I bet you there aren't very many of these around today that still have the Harmony label stuck in the pick guard here, because if you play with an open hand, you're going to hit it with your fingers every single time you strum. Boy, does it get annoying. <laughs> 